Okay, so now for our hydrophilic pathway. Again, it's good to think of it in the context, and the main context that they give it to us in, in VCE is when we're talking about protein-based hormones. Now, our protein-based hormones are <clears throat> typically hydrophilic, and therefore, as they also go through the bloodstream, they do not require a carrier. As they are already hydrophilic, they're happy to be in that water, and so they move around until they come up to a cell which has their complementary receptor protein. Okay, so here we do have a complementary receptor. Remember, the, these are all proteins, and so what is complementary is the tertiary or quaternary structure. When that um, messenger molecule does bind with our receptor, we're going to, just as we see in the hydrophobic pathway, see a conformational change. That conformational change is going to be for this receptor, both on the outside, that extracellular portion of the protein, but also the intracellular portion of the protein. So the part within the cell. Ultimately, we know that this protein-based hormone is hydrophilic, and therefore it can't pass directly through the plasma membrane due to the lipid tails. Proteins like this are also quite large, so they could potentially go down channel proteins or otherwise would have to undergo endocytosis. Endocytosis, though, is very active and also would break around the breakdown of the vesicle once they were in. It's not a very effective or efficient way for the message to be carried. So instead we have what we call the first messenger, okay, we've got the first messenger which attaches to the receptor on the extracellular side of the plasma membrane. That then undergoes a conformational change in the tertiary quaternary structure, and I'm just going to adjust this little diagram here because that's not a receptor itself. What this one here is, is a membrane-bound enzyme, okay, so this membrane-bound enzyme again made up of protein it can have tertiary and quaternary structure potentially um, and the conformational change actually activates this enzyme that means that a reaction is going to be catalyzed the reaction in this case that's catalyzed is a production of secondary messengers it's really important that you know this term this is another way other than the fact that the receptor is on the membrane rather than within the cytosol Another way that these two pathways differ, that we have our one first messenger, and then once that activates an enzyme, you actually get tens of thousands of these secondary messages being produced in the cell. We don't need to know um, the specifics of all of these. You will see these are described as CAMP, cyclic AMP, um, but as I just stated, we don't need to know the specifics of this pathway as is stated explicitly in the study design. These tens of thousands of secondary messengers actually go on to activate other key enzymes. An example of those are kinases which cleave, so basically chop up, other proteins. This continues, you get a cascade, we actually do call this a cascade, an enzyme cascade where we have an original signal of one messenger molecule to tens of thousands and onwards. Okay, this enzyme cascade results in a little bit like a megaphone where you have a small signal being originally sent out and then you've got a giant message being emitted later on. Okay, so this enzyme cascade and what it's actually doing is amplification. So this small message is then getting shouted or sent all around the cell. Those key enzymes can go on to do many, many things. So they, for example, could cleave other proteins or activate enzymes that already exist in the cell. An example of this would be procaspases, which then lead to apoptosis. Okay, you can learn about that um, in the next stop point. They could activate enzymes. They could also do the exact same thing as our hydrophobic pathways, where they could alter gene expression. The difference, another difference between these two pathways, is that our hydrophilic does not have to alter gene expression, but it can. It can um, produce, just like with our hydrophobic, could be a structural or a regulatory protein. Those proteins will go on and do whatever they're set to. Really, the key difference or the key idea for hydrophilic is that there can be a range of changes to cellular processing or cellular processes. So between these, if we consider, we've got our reception with our hydrophobic pathway. Reception happens in our intracellular environment, whereas for our hydrophilic, it's extracellular. Transduction is always going to differ regardless or for each of the different pathways. However, a hydrophobic is very simple. It's just gene expression adjustment, whereas a hydrophilic involves the activation of secondary messengers and an enzyme cascade.
now for a quick summary of this. Our main um, differences between the two pathways include site of reception, complexity of transduction, and possibilities for possible cellular responses. For both of the second two, um, obviously hydrophilic is more complex, and just outlining some of the keywords that I really want you to make sure that you have under your belt following this, secondary messenger, okay, a enzyme cascade, the idea of amplification in our hydrophilic, okay, being really on top of intra versus extracellular as words, and being specific whenever you talk about it, um, of a conformational change in tertiary or quaternary structure, and finally our DNA binding region I think is important for you to understand. So thanks for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and let us know if there are any other VCE bio videos you'd like.